Anthony. I am a nurse since 2017. I've worked in emergency departments kind of all over the United States. And I'm currently working at a pediatric emergency department, which I never thought I'd enjoy, but I really do. And right. And I also dabble in uh, conscious sedation, which is also fun. And I may or may not have time to tell you some funny stories about that as well. I did not take a traditional route to become a nurse. Uh, we grew up very poor. And so when I decided that I wanted to start nursing school in some fashion, I went to a community college in the suburb where I lived. And I was able to um, receive my associate degree in nursing from there and then sit for my boards and then start working. And that was what was more important for me to be able to start working so that I could get, get experience, so that I could travel and so I could have enough money to get a bachelor's degree. So I got my BSN and my MSN online and I'm currently finishing my DMP. I'll be done next summer. Um, thank you, thank you. I have a bunch of new grays on this side and it's from my DMP. Um, so, so I was a firefighter before I became a nurse and that's actually how I know, I know. <laughs> I saw that. That's how I found out I wanted to be a nurse. Um, I was in, let me start, let me start a little bit further back. So th I'm, this is not planned, but I'm gonna tell y'all for context. I was in high school and one of the things that we had to do in our senior year is talk to the guidance counselor about what we want to do after graduation. So I'm sitting in the little waiting area, waiting for her office door to open for me to go in. And I see a little turn turnstile thingy. Is that what it's called? With the pamphlets, a bunch of brochures, whatever that thing is, the stand. And I start spinning it because I was bored. I wasn't even actually interested in what was on it. And I spun it and when it stopped, there was a pamphlet, a brochure with a black girl with a firefighter helmet, a firefighter jacket, and she was holding an ax. And I was like, damn, that's cool. I could do that, right? <laughs> and in my high school head, this isn't just some model, right? This is an actual black girl firefighter, which means that I can be a black girl firefighter. So I went into the guidance counselor's office and I told her that's what I wanted to do. I literally just slapped the pamphlet on her desk and I said, that's it right there. And that's my story about how I got into firefighting. And I didn't hate it. I didn't hate being a firefighter. I started doing some training right when I was in high school and then sort of graduated out of that once I graduated high school. I was hired onto a part-time department. We carry these little pagers. And whenever there was a call, it was uh, like a township department in out of Aurora. So whenever there was a call, our pagers would go off, we'd get to the station as fast as possible. The first three people to arrive got to go on the call. Anyone who was still there, they sort of just stood on standby or they could go home, whatever. But sometimes, you know, they would call it a second ambulance or a fire engine or the truck. So at one point, my chief said, anyone who wants to continue working for this department, you have to get your ENT license. If you don't have your ENT license, you have six months and then you're out. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll do it. So <laughs> I signed up for the ENT courses at the community college. And part of getting your ENT license is you take this eight week course, I took it over the summer, and you have to do 40 hours of observation in the emergency room. And that is when everything changed for me. When I was in the ER, watching these nurses work, watching the techs work, watching the coordination, it, it felt almost, almost like an orchestra of just everyone working together and coming together to make sure that they were making people feel better. Not even just saving lives, right? There wasn't a whole lot of trauma or anything like that that I saw, but I saw a diverse sort of array of health problems. And then I saw all these health problems being addressed. And I fell in love with that. So that's when I decided I wanted to be a nurse. So that's how we got here, okay? Um, I did get my EMT license. I did work as an EMT and I continued on the fire department for a little bit. And then I eventually quit and I cleaned treadmills at the gym while I was in nursing school and I loved it. So 
I wrote a book. <laughs> I skipped ahead a little bit, I know. But it was important for me to share the experiences that I had as a nurse in different hospitals across the country. So before we get into this presentation, which I made this presentation with myself in mind. I'm not even gonna sit here and lie to you. I get very bored very easily. I don't know if I have a short attention span or if just as I get older, I have less patience, but because I get bored very easily, I created this presentation with that in mind. So the presentation is very colorful. It's very interactive. There are videos sort of scattered throughout the presentation. And I did all those things because I wanna keep you all engaged. So before we get into it though, I wanna read you all a passage from my book. Is that okay? All right, but. So when I wrote my book, I also wrote it with myself, <laughs> with myself in mind. I get bored reading easily, especially chapter books. I find myself uh, unable to complete a full chapter before getting tired, bored, sleepy, or whatever, and stopping. So there was a book that I read in my undergrad called The Wall of Silence, and it was written by a nurse named Rosemary Gibson. And the book is written in vignettes. So you read a short story, maybe a page or two, and then you're done. And then you read the next story, and then the next. And for me, that was so digestible and a way for me to really access the, the material without sort of tiring myself out. So my book is written in vignettes and the vignette I'm gonna read you is called, I'm Not Fond of Your Kind. Here we go. One afternoon after I had transitioned to the 1 p.m. to 1 a.m. shift, I walked into a patient's room to introduce myself. Thus far, it had been a reasonably quiet shift. This particular patient had been under the care of another nurse who I'd be taking over for. When I walked into the room, I did a double take. Dude was a spitting image of Winston Churchill. That's not what it says. It says this man, but dude. With hard creases across his forehead and bushy eyebrows that angled downward towards his nose, he appeared angry. He was not, in fact, he was adorable, but he still intimidated me. After writing my name on the whiteboard in his room, I showed him how to use his call button in case he needed anything while I was out of the room. Is there anything I can get you right now, I asked. He paused and then replied, I need to change my diaper, but I don't need help. Just bring it to me. I smiled. No problem, I'll bring one in right away. As I turned to open the door, the patient added, you know, I'm not fond of your kind. My palms moistened, my heart rate increased, the hairs on my arms immediately stood at attention. All I could think was this old white man is about to share with me his past experiences with the freedmen and how I don't deserve to be working as a nurse, how our kind is culpable for ruining his majority white society. I closed my eyes and inhaled deeply, hoping to rid myself of any negative self thoughts with a deep exhale. As I turned back around and faced him, I asked, I'm sorry, sir. Why is that? I watched as he seemed to ruminate, trying to find the right way to express his feelings. Then he finally opened his mouth. Slowly, he said, because your kind have the straps on them, they tend to fall off my behind. Mine are the pull-up kind, they fit better, but you never have those here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad y'all got to take that ride with me. With a sigh of relief and a chuckle, I apologized for not having the type of brief that the patient preferred. He assured me that it was okay and apologized for complaining. I validated his concern for wanting a well-fitting brief and I departed the room to grab a new one for him. As I walked to the storage room, I recognized that intertwined with my career would be the intangible hair-raising specter of oppression, racism, sexism, and homophobia. It would linger over me always, a threatening shadow following me. Y'all, I was like, what? I was, <laughs> I was ready to fight this old man. I'm not fond of your kind, excuse me? How do, we get, how do we get here? Anyway, let's get into our presentation. Like I said, I get bored. Um, so 
lots of color, lots of animation. I do wanna give this trigger warning though, as we go through this presentation, there's gonna be discussions of racism. There's gonna be uh, racial slurs. There's going to be homophobic language used and in, in, all in an effort to share people's stories, right? With that being said, you will feel uncomfortable during parts of this presentation. I'm sure that maybe for a second during that story, you felt a little bit uncomfortable. Raise your hand if you did. I know, I did too. And I just wanna encourage you all to one, take care of yourselves, right? Whatever that looks like. And two, I want you to challenge yourselves to sit in that discomfort when it comes because liberation cannot occur without discomfort. It's easy for us to run away from things that make us uncomfortable, but when we challenge ourselves to engage in conversations like this, we move forward. So we're here because again, I think that in having these conversations, we can move all of, we can move ourselves and those around us towards liberation. And in the six years, seven years, I don't know, however many years I've been a nurse, I've witnessed uh, various encounters where people are mistreated because of the color of their skin. They're mistreated because of their reproductive organs. They're mistreated because of the amount of money that they have or don't. And so I think that when y'all lead, you might have a little bit more empowerment to have these conversations with others, regardless of where you come from, regardless of your race, regardless of your gender, regardless of your sexuality. <laughs> I like this. So the breaking news is that queer people are not safe, trans people are not safe, gender non-conforming people are not safe. But, we all have the ability to do something about it. I'm gonna say it one more time. We all have the ability to do something about it. Did y'all hear what I said? What'd I say? Oh, okay. I was making sure, I just checking. So before you is a list of names. Can you guess what these names are? Can you guess the meaning behind these names? Huh? Not all. Very, very, very close. They're all trans people who were murdered in 2023. I could not fit all the names on this one page. So this is just a snippet, okay? 50% of them are black trans women. 84% of them are people of color. This is another one of those moments where you need to sit in your discomfort because we cannot ignore statistics like this. 50% black trans women, 84% people of color. Before I get ahead of myself, here are some of our objectives. So I'm hoping that when you all leave here, you'll be able to describe ways in which our own bias can cause harm to others. I'm hoping that we'll be able to discuss methods of communication to create equitable healthcare practices. I'm hoping that you'll be able to understand the impact of intersectionality as it relates to healthcare practices. And I hope that you can develop an increased comfort in caring for sexual and gender minority patients. So this is where the videos start. I think that just as my voice is important, your voice is important, your voice is important, your voice is important. Every single person in here has a different story, right? A unique story, a unique self. And because of that, I think it's important that we hear from diverse voices. So I called on my community. I asked my community different questions. So the first video you're gonna see is I asked my friend Simone, what does intersectionality mean to her? Now, Simone is very young and Simone does young people things. I don't know how old you are in the audience, but Simone is driving in this video. And although I could have made her re-record it, she did a wonderful job. So I kept it. <laughs> you ready? Can't hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Simone. Simone. She can do everything, including recording a video and driving at the same time. So, <laughs> and there's, oh, hey. I didn't know you were coming and then I saw you. Thank you. Intersectionality is a, a term coined by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, a professor of law and civil rights activist. Uh, she defines intersectionality as the complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism, and classism combine, overlap, or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or groups. With that being said, um, the Williams Institute conducted this study. They did it like a study series, sort of. And they looked at different intersections between being queer, trans, LGBTQ, and XYZ, right? So when they looked at LGBTQ plus folks who were white versus people of color and, and identified as LGBTQ, um, they found that 47% as opposed to 36% of people of color who identify as queer, trans, live in poverty. When they looked at rates of depression, they found that more white queer and trans folks, uh, I, I reported having depression versus people of color. Now, before we move forward, I have a pop quiz. If anyone in this room can tell me the running joke in the black community about depression, you go to your mom and you say, Ma, I'm depressed. What's the response? That's one, that's one, but I'm looking for something else. That's a, that's a good one. <laughs> that's another one. That's definitely, that's definitely a response. I've never heard that response but I'm sure someone's mom has given them that response. Go depress. Go depress. Them dishes. See? <laughs> you knew it. It was just back there somewhere. And I know that, you know, we use this humor to sort of cope, but in, it really is black, in the black community, mental health, issues, depression, anxiety, things like that. There's this, there's this stigma and this taboo surrounding it. And so, especially I, for my generation, talking about depression, that's the response that I got growing up. Go depress them dishes. I'll give you something, like you said, I'll give you something to be depressed about. Um, it's because you didn't go to church with me this past Sunday, right? Things like that. And so we've sort of, generation after generation, we've perpetuated this stigma and this taboo around mental health. And it has created this environment where we feel like we can't have discussions about the way that we feel, right? Or we, we feel like we have to be strong and persevere through everything that we go through as opposed to addressing the way that we actually feel. And God forbid seeking help for it, right? And I'm not saying that that's the reason for these numbers, but I am saying that that's part of it. It's something that we need to think about and consider, especially when we're taking care of people in any, in any environment, right? The hospital, um, social work, wherever we're at, it's something to consider. And that's why educating ourselves is really important. So, Syed Jones, he's a dope writer. Um, being black can get you killed, being gay can get you killed. Being a black gay boy is a death wish. And one day, if you're lucky, your life and death will become some artist's new project. So we're gonna talk about the intersection of race and sexuality as it relates to being black, male and queer. So we think about the, the different modes of oppression that exist in the black community, especially against black men, right? Um, they are often criminalized. 
they are, I, I think, what was it last week or this past week that a gas station called 911 because a white man was doing something weird and then the white man left. No, 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 the white man was there and he told the police, no, it was him and pointed at a black man. And so then the police, there's video of the police tackling this, this black man to the ground, a black man who wasn't doing anything to anybody, just minding his business. But it, all it took was one single person to say, no, it was him for him to get attacked, blamed, no questions asked. So black men have to deal with that. Black men have to deal with toxic masculinity, not just in general, but in the black community. They're expect, they're kind of forced into these gender roles as black men where they are taught that they have to be strong, that they cannot cry, that they have to take care of others, right? And so they, they grow up having this, this expectation of themselves uh, forced upon them based, uh, based off their community. Anti-Black racism, which we just talked about, right? Simply being, simply being Black and being a man. And then homophobia on top of all of that. And previous research, current research is showing that because of the, the multi, um, the multiple uh, systems of oppression that sort of work against Black men, especially when, when Black men are gay, that this is causing folks to sort of reject their identity, right? So not coming out or not sharing that with other people or, or trying to date the opposite sex because they think that that's what their community wants and that's what society believes that they're, they're supposed to do, right? And so not living in their truths. I have a story, you ready? So this has absolutely nothing to do with homophobia, but I took care of a 12 year old whose sister decided to throw her iPad at his balls and she threw it really hard and it caused his testicles to twist and uh, he ended up with testicular torsion. And she felt really bad, which she should. But he's in the room, he's in the ER, he's about to go to surgery. And the surgeon comes in and says, hey, I'm Dr. So-and-so, I'm, I'm here to ask you some questions, you know, and his whole family's there and they're being really supportive, but the doctor asked them to step out so that he could ask these questions. And so I immediately knew, okay, we're about to talk about sex, because they always ask the parents to leave. He said to the kid, oh, are you sexually active? And I'm like, what the hell did he just say? And so I knew that if I couldn't hear what he said fully, that the patient didn't hear what he said fully. But I'm like, let me just see how this plays out. Sometimes I'm just messy at work. So the kid said, yes, but straight face, yep, immediately. And I was shocked. The kid came from a Muslim family, a very traditional Muslim family. He was very young, right? I in just my head and what I knew, my ex-wife is Muslim, right? I know that it is not accepted to one, be queer Muslim, we'll get to that, but to be 12 and just out here doing the, doing the do, there's no way, right? So all this is going through my head as they're having this conversation. So at this point, I'm just like, so the doctor says, okay, so do you use protection? And the kid said, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, what? Where are we going? Where is what is this? And the doctor said, okay, well, what kind? What kind of protection? And the kid said, well, it depends. When I ride my bike, I wear my helmet. <laughs> when I'm on my skateboard, I usually wear like the elbow pads. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. He, the kid heard, are you active? <laughs> because the doctor sort of like sexually, sort of like mumbled sexually instead of just asking the question, right? Like a professional, you went, to, you went to all those years of medical school, you can't say sexually to a kid, right? And so this conversation was going way over there <laughs> when it should have been going this way, right? So once we cleared all that up, <laughs> the kid explained that he like, oh no, ew, no. No, I'm active. <laughs> but not like that, right? Imagine if the doctor had just 
left it where it was, right? And sort of went out to talk to his parents about him being sexually active. How do you think that would have went over for him? Right. And then for our patients who are sexually active, we order certain tests for them just to make sure that we, you know, that we clear everything. And so they would have been ordering unnecessary tests, right, for this kid. And that would have been billed to their insurance, right? Hopefully they would have covered it. Who knows, right? This is, this is how important it is to have effective communication with our patients. I'm so glad I let that play out because I'm able to tell this story. But I knew right away that the kid did not hear what the doctor said. And I could have said, no, 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 no. He said, do you have sex? Like, you, you know, the, just wording it in a way that the kid can understand, but you're a pediatric surgeon. You should be able to know how to talk to kids about anything, including sex. So the intersection of homophobia and Islamophobia, um, as I stated, my ex-wife is Muslim. And so every time she went to the airport, they would pull her aside because her middle name was uh, Muhammad. And she'd have to go through an additional security check, right? And this got to the point where she decided to remove her middle name uh, from, her, from her passport, from her license, just in general. So she legally removed her middle name so that she wouldn't have to deal with that every time she went to the airport. In addition to that, if she wanted to go to a mosque in any state, right? The fact that she was with her wife would have been an issue. I say all that to say that folks who are Muslim and identify as queer or trans, they can't practice their religion the way that everyone else can. They can't go to the mosque and pray like everyone else can. It's not accessible to them. So, We're gonna go back for a second. So remember when I said that we need to be able to communicate with our patients in a way that they can understand? I have another story and then we'll move on to bias. There was a young girl who came in with lots of bleeding from below her waist and she was seven months pregnant. So of course, we're all thinking she's you know, having this, this early delivery, um, you know, everyone's getting all worked up and the ambulance brings her in, they put her in the bed. Her boyfriend's at the bedside, very nice guy, loved him. And the doctor comes in and we raise the sheet. And I immediately see there's absolutely nothing coming from her vagina. So baby's still in there, right? So then where is she bleeding from? There's only, there's only so many places she could be bleeding from, right? Turns out she's bleeding from her, her bottom. And so, I asked her to lay on her side so that we can kind of see what's going on back there. And doc comes in and doesn't introduce himself to the patient, just immediately starts talking to the nursing staff. He says, oh, she's having a rectal prolapse. Give me this, give me that, give me this, give me that. The, the pregnancy's fine, we can call OB, right? Just, just rambling off all these orders. Again, still has not said a single word to the patient. So the patient, scared, right, thinking that, she's about to deliver, says, what, what, is, what is he saying? What's going, what are you saying? And his response was, oh no, I'm talking to them. Don't, I'm talking to them, the nurses, right? So at that point I'm mad because now you're dismissing the patient. The only reason why we're all in this room, you're dismissing her. So I looked at her and again, this, this patient is so young that she can't legally drive yet. I said, girl, your ass is falling out. We got to put it back in. And her boyfriend just starts rolling on the floor, rolling on the floor. He said that she was on the toilet for so long. I told her to get off the toilet. See, I told you that was going to happen. Right. And so all of a sudden the spirits in the room are lifted because they know that their, you know, their baby isn't in harm's way. Their baby is safe. They know that the problem that, that we're having, we're able to fix it and address it in this moment. And her boyfriend's hilarious. Right? And so now she understands what's going on. And so about an hour later, I come by the room and I'm like, they put your booty back in. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, girl, it's back in, we're good. <laughs> I won't sit on TikTok on the toilet anymore. 
right? And so just making that, that whole experience could have been so traumatic for this patient, right? And lightening the mood might not be the, the, the case or what's needed for everybody, but I could tell that's what she needed. And most importantly, she needed someone to communicate with her. Nobody was. So that's my story. Anyway, the definition of bias, according to the dictionary, is a personal and sometimes unreasoned judgment. So next, you'll hear from a colleague of mine. His name is E. And the trigger warning that I gave in the beginning, yup, sound. The trigger warning that I gave in the beginning mostly applies to the video that you're about to watch. It's just under five minutes and he's gonna share a story. I asked him, can you describe a time where somebody else's bias impacted you? Let's do it. This is the last video, I promise. Thank you. 
I'm going to stop it because we're almost out of time and the folks on Zoom couldn't hear it. So I'm going to paraphrase E's story real quick. It's okay. <laughs> so um, E was, at, for those of you on Zoom who didn't get to hear that, E is a diva and E was in New York with his boyfriend at the time and was at a train station, took a selfie and was physically attacked, him and his boyfriend, because of the way that they looked. And so to put it bluntly, because of that, now E tries to dress more manly because he doesn't want to be attacked while walking down the street minding his own business. And so I just want you to take a second to imagine being inside of your closet, right? Inside, outside, whatever, standing in front of your clothing and thinking, okay, what's not gonna get me physically assaulted today? What can I put on that's not gonna make me a target? And imagine how that feels. Every day, that's ease life. We'll skip through some of these statistics because I know I'm out of time. I talk too much, y'all. All right, so how do we achieve LGBTQ plus equity? The Human Rights Campaign has some recommendations, talking openly and honestly about LGBTQ loved ones uh, and with LGBTQ loved ones. Uh, if you are in a situation where you hear someone make a joke, a comment, or whatever, um, being empowered to to say something about it and I know that in situations certain situations we don't feel comfortable doing that especially in work situations things like that we all need to collect our check we all need to sort of stay out of trouble if you will so I understand that but there comes a time where our silence is complicity so we need to make sure that we sort of keep an eye out on that and then uh, posting uh, messages in support of LGBTQ folks. It's, that's something I do. Um, before my book, I didn't use social media because I don't care for it. But uh, I have built a decent little platform and I use that in order to uplift other folks, uh, to uplift marginalized groups and uh, to educate people because I think that that is where we start. So self-reflection, listening and welcoming and education. Um, I read a lot, um, mostly because I want to, if, if I'm going to have an art, so my, my friend Simone, she called me the other day on FaceTime and she said, Brittany, talk to my cousin. He's talking about, uh, Kamala Harris, da, 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 da. And I was like, oh boy. So I get on the phone with this guy and we're about to, we're about to debate, right? I'm ready. But then he starts talking about conspiracies and I said, oh, Simone, don't know. I'm not going to debate a conspiracy theorist, honey. Get off my phone. I'm hanging my little whiteboard. Um, I want to arm myself with as much information as possible so that I'm able to have educated conversations. I'm okay with having a disagreement with somebody and still going to dinner. That's fine. I, I am not a person that takes disagreements personal, or I'm not a person that can't get along with someone just because they feel a different way than I do, right? So I say all that to say that educating ourselves is so important and we can't be out here just having discussions and arguments with people without any sort of context, information, background, or anything like that. So please pick up a book, read an article, I don't care. But you, people try to have arguments with me about what, um, what Tuskegee was. You can't have an argument with me about what Tuskegee, the Tuskegee Project was without having ever read a, a single word about the Tuskegee project, right? I'm off my soapbox. Thank you. <laughs>